Hello once again and welcome to the Mayor's Magazine. I'm Mick Cornett, the Mayor of Oklahoma City, and this is our show for September 2014. In this first segment, we're going to learn more about what's called Create Great Neighborhoods. It's a program that the Neighborhood Alliance is working on along with OGE. And here to discuss it are representatives from both. Closest to me, Jennifer Meckling, she's the program director at Neighborhood Alliance. And Susan Harkness has been at OGE longer than either one of us want to <laughs> remember. But she's the brand manager uh, yes, thank at, you. at the electric company. Yeah. It's great to have you both here. Wonderful to be here. Thank okay, you. Okay, Susan, i got to figure this out. So this is about conservation. This is about neighborhoods coming together. Give me, give me some mm -hmm. background on, the, on the, the scope of this project. And putting well, it you together. know, Jeannie has positive energy together. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking to do is to use a grassroots approach for sustainability and social responsibility as it relates to energy efficiency, water conservation, recycling. Uh, and the neighborhoods are really a great starting point for growing up uh, that kind of a cultural change. And we think that between what they can learn from og &E with our programs along with what the Office of uh, Sustainability in Oklahoma City provides, it's a great opportunity for neighborhoods is to this, be great. Is this really part of an educational program and you can use the, the, the organizations that neighborhoods already have to illustrate examples of how we can mm -hmm. all conserve? Absolutely. Uh, the neighborhoods are using all of their tools. It might be a newsletter or an email. It could be a gathering in the middle of the block. Uh, we've done all kinds of things with them to affect understanding and education around programs that og &E offers like smart hours and home energy efficiency, weatherization services, things of that nature, uh, and along with having speakers that they can bring to their meetings if they like and, and uh, we'll uh, try to help them understand how to be a great neighborhood. All right. And Jennifer, what's in this for Neighborhood Alliance? Well, Neighborhood Alliance, we like to see neighborhoods come together and build those social connections that makes for a safer, healthier neighborhood. And this is an ideal way for neighborhood people to connect. Um, I think as you probably know from your million dollar challenge or million pound challenge that taking that first step with people is often the hardest. So this is a way to get neighbors engaged, get them talking to each other and working toward a common goal. And as they work through the summer using some of the tools that we're giving them to put messages in their newsletter, share things on social media and perhaps come up with a great team building neighborhood project that's centered around sustainability or uh, environmentalness. Um, they can work together toward that common goal, and we hope they'll, at the end of the summer, have a great story to tell us. Is, is, as a neighborhood gets involved and makes that choice, what happens next? We, uh, we sign them up, put them on our mailing list, and on a couple times a week, they'll get an email from us telling them about some new things that are on the website. They'll have opportunities to take things from that website and share them with their neighbors. A lot of that information has been provided by the city's sustainability office. A lot of great ideas for neighborhood projects, such as a curbs to creek program that's labeling the storm drains in the street, saying that these go directly to your creeks and, and have direct contact with, with wildlife. That's a great project. Great team building for a neighborhood association. And then once people are involved, they've got those social connections, it just builds from there. Mm -hmm. And I noticed there are, there are prizes involved. There absolutely are. og &E has provided grant funds of $5,000. And at the end of the summer, neighborhoods will apply um, by writing a grant application. The top three neighborhoods that show us they have a great story to tell about how they educated and increased awareness of sustainability. Those three neighborhoods will be awarded grant funds in the amount of $2,500, $1,500, and $1,000. Susan, how will you know if this was a successful program? How will you judge it when, at the end of the day? I, you know, I think any time you're doing something as meaningful as changing cultural perception, uh, I always like to think that Oklahomans are just a little bit more savvy about energy, the responsibility to produce it wisely, use it wisely. This is a great opportunity for neighborhoods to demonstrate that. Also, it's been a wonderful tool for us to demystify, you know, some of the questions that um, our customers have about some of the programs that get socialized incorrectly and the neighborhoods are really being a conduit for providing a dialogue uh, for og &E with the customers directly that is helping uh, them understand the benefits that they can enjoy by using conservation and really just efficient practice good you know just being smart about the use and how they can also affect lower electric bills mm -hmm. and um you know, I would 
think at first glance OGE wants to sell all the electricity they can. They ought to want people to turn those thermostats <laughs> down and that this is, this is a proactive step toward being more responsible. Well, absolutely, but stop and think about this. If we learn to live within our generation means, uh, and that's by you know producing it correct, wisely, using it wisely, we can delay building incremental fossil fuel plants uh, and that's going to save everybody money uh, in, in the end on their bills. And so I think that uh, younger people in particular, some of the younger homeowners, really are gravitating to the social goodness of this idea. Uh, I think some of us, like myself, we just like saving money. <laughs> but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah. Well, OG is a great corporate citizen, so please take along our thanks back back to the office and uh, and and Jennifer let's let's segue now to a little bit more about neighborhood alliance if someone's watching this show perhaps they just moved here they don't know anything about it mm -hmm. give us kind of a, a primer on on why neighborhood alliance should be something they have on their on the refrigerator door. <laughs> Absolutely. Our mission is to create and sustain safe, beautiful, healthy neighborhoods. And we're the only agency in Oklahoma City that provides neighborhood specific leadership training to help train those individuals within the neighborhood, sort of create that spark that can help them create an awareness within their neighborhood of how important it is to stay social and to get to know your neighbors. And as neighbors, we are uniquely qualified to notice what's uh, off in our neighborhood. To yeah. notice some suspicious activity well, and report you're that. You're absolutely right because, you know, really the first step at, at crime prevention, you know, is at the neighborhood level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, no one's going to see something suspicious um, uh, more quickly than a nosy neighbor. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> and we love those nosy neighbors. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, so their willingness to get involved. And we've had incredible um, um, decreases in the amount of crime in Oklahoma City the last two years. And I, I think it's because we're being smarter about the way that we're uh, in, involving the police and getting them. Uh, more education out to the neighborhoods about how they can be a part of the, of the, of the awareness problem. Um, anything else we need to know? Our neighborhood website, nacok.org, and for the Create Great Neighborhoods program, it has its own website, creategreatneighborhoods.org. They can go online and find out all they want there, and they can call our office anytime and call Susan as well. Right, we have a discovery dinners uh, every two weeks, which is a great way to learn about the programs and some of the opportunities here in Oklahoma City. Uh, for participating and enjoying uh, being a good neighbor. And uh, so we invite everybody to get involved and I think uh, it's positive energy together. Well, and, and you all are great spokespeople for, for our community and, and your projects. So thank, thank you. Thank you both, Jennifer Meckling and Susan Harkness, um, working to help save energy in the state of Oklahoma. So I urge you to get part of your neighborhood association. And if you haven't heard about it through your neighborhood association, ask them about it. And uh, they'll get in touch with Neighborhood Alliance and get you guys down the track. And maybe you guys can qualify for one of those grants from OG&E. We'll have more on the Mayor's Magazine right after this. How you can go green brought to you by the City of Oklahoma City. Reduce the amount of waste in your home by reusing shopping bags or buying items that have less packaging. Drink tap water and reusable bottles. Help eliminate plastic water bottles in our landfills. Conserve water. Water the lawn only when it needs it, and in the early morning or late afternoon. For recycling information and other green tips, visit OKC.gov. Welcome back to the Mayor's Magazine. Before you know it, the Oklahoma State Fair is going to be here again, and here to talk about the 2014 version is Scott Munns. He is the Vice President of Marketing and Public Relations. Welcome to the Mayor's Magazine. Thank you very much for having me. Obviously, it's September, and that's State Fair Month. Yeah, it's coming up, and, and I, I guess the, the first thing we need to let people know is what's different this year? If they show up at the fair and they have a routine down, uh, are we going to alter their routine, and if so, what do they need to know before they get in the gates? Well, I mean, we have some new shows. Obviously, the Disney on Ice is new each year. This year, it's Disney on Ice presents Let's Celebrate. Uh, the Extreme Bulls have two new performers. We have uh, Jared Neiman on Friday night and Charlie Daniels Band on Saturday, and then we have a whole new lineup on the Chickasaw Entertainment stage. We have some new free shows around the grounds. Of course, there's always some new State Fair food, so we like to keep it fresh. We work real hard throughout the year to try to give them something new every time they come in the gates. Yeah, so you got new food. New Can food. Can you tell me about it? Uh, a couple of them that I'll hit. We are having a deep-fried giant gummy bear on a stick. I've been waiting for Have that. You? Well, <laughs> it really is. It really doesn't fit with your uh, dietary missions, but you know, of course, 
come state fair time, you really have to skip your diets and just go out and enjoy the food. Is it, is it a giant gum? Because gummy bears aren't right. very no, big. No, no, it's tough to put a stick in a giant, yeah. in, a, in a miniature gummy. Yeah, you so kill no. the gummy yeah, bear right yeah, off the bat. Be, so it's a big gummy bear. It's a big gummy bear, and it's deep fried, and of course it is on a stick like a lot of the items that are out there. We have a red velvet uh, cinnamon roll this year, which is a little wow. take on the... Uh, I love red velvet. Yeah, and cinnamon rolls are, are one of the big three cinnamon out rolls, there. Oh, too. yeah, so they, know, it's a perfect mix. Some sort of collision here. Yes, it is. It'll of, be a dietetic. Of, of, of outstanding taste. Wow. Okay, and I can't have one of those until Thursday, the the. the, the the 11th, yeah, the 11th huh? of September, and then right. we, we also have a caveman. You're, you're getting me excited. <laughs> just, just so far with the food, the well, gummy bear. I don't know the gummy bear and the and the cinnamon roll, uh, based on red velvet. Right. We may top it with the uh, caveman turkey leg, which is a bacon wrapped uh, turkey <laughs> leg. So turkey legs are very popular at the Oklahoma State Fair, and yeah. of course everybody likes bacon. So again, you combine those two things, and you have a winner for sure. Dang, I, this is going to be some state fair. All right. Um, I know we have some new paved parking, and, and uh, you know people take parking for granted at the fair because most of it's free. Uh, if, if it's not paved, it's it's always and still free. But you know, first time it rains, you know people appreciate that paved parking, and they might not pay, might not mind paying five or ten bucks. Yeah, they certainly will. The old footprint of the grandstand, which is off of May Avenue at Gate Five. Uh, will be a paved, paid parking lot this year. It will also house some of our permit parking and also our commissary area. So we're using, we're putting that to good use this year. And like you said, certainly in the case of inclement weather, which we hope will never happen, uh, <laughs> but because it is the fair, a state fair time, we know that we'll probably get a little bit. Uh, they have the ability to park on hard surface. Plus it's right outside gate five, which is very convenient to enter into the property. So yeah, so that May Avenue entrance, um, and there's been some road construction out that way, but our fingers are crossed. That's going to be all taken care of by the time you come. And uh, and and there's got to be hundreds of spots out there. I mean, oh yeah, I've, even I've thousands probably. Thousands. No, it's it's yeah. a, it's a huge area, especially now. It's paved now. It's striped now. It looks very expansive. But as we start to fill it in with some of the different things, like I said, the the permit parking, the the commissary and stuff, there'll still be thousands of uh, paid spaces available. Come in at Gate Five off of May Avenue, and it's uh, very convenient. Like I said, to the entrance to the property. Mm -hmm. Um, what type of attendance have you been having in recent years? We've had anywhere between 900,000 and a million. It's very contingent, as you would imagine, being an outdoor event on what the weather deals us. Last couple of years, we've been uh, around that 900,000 mark because we have had some inclement weather on the first couple of days. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. We got all the rain out in July and August, and hopefully it'll be uh, you know pleasant fall weather come September, and the rain will skip us. Yeah, <laughs> but that's probably a pipe dream. How about on the ag side? What do you what do you have at the fair that people? Well, of course we have the to? you know we have we have all the typical competitions, whether it's sheep or cattle or or mm -hmm. lamb. We have uh, on the equine side, which we kind of qualify as livestock. Also, we're doing the uh, North American Six Horse Hitch on the last weekend. What which is, is that? It's the North American Six Horse Hitch Championship. It's the big draft horses. So, I mean, these are these are uh, Clydesdales, these are Pergerons, these are the Belgiums, these are the big horses. Mm -hmm. And they're doing the old draft horse type, you know, like you're familiar to seeing with the Budweiser Clydesdales right. or whatever, and they do a six horse hitch. It's actually going to be uh, uh, broadcast on RFD TV, so it's a big event for us. This is the second year for the North American Six Horse Hitch, and the first time that RFD has decided it's meritous to put it on their uh, on their program. So is this a competition? Yeah, it's a competition. Not, people, a, not a race. No, it's not a race. Work, it's yeah. a competition. It really is, you know, based on how much weight they're pulling, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a competition. Uh, teams come from all over the country. Obviously, the uh, Express Clydesdales will be participating in it, but uh, there will be draft horse teams coming from all over the place. And uh, what's the most popular aspect of the fairgrounds? And I, I, I could guess, but I don't want to. So tell me, what when, when a person walks into the fair what, and, and they have a list of three or four things they're going to want to see or do, what's, what, what, what's on more lists than others? Well, I, I would venture to say it's probably the food, but I would also say that it's <laughs> contingent on what demo you ask. Uh -huh. You ask young kids, they're going to say the carnival lot, they want to ride the rides. 
see what's new, see what, you know, what the carnival games might be. You ask an older individual, such as myself at least, they want to see the creative arts, they want to see the competitive events, the pie baking, the different, the different things that are in the creative arts mm -hmm. building. Uh, of course, like I said, there's great state fair food. And then, you know, high on a lot of people's lists is people watching. They love to come out to the fair and watch. Uh, I like all of those things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There, I there's no list, loser in the batch. There really isn't, so. Yeah, and um, um, if, if, if people were trying to pick a time of day when maybe it's less crowded, when would you suggest they come out? Uh, you know, obviously any time during the week, the earlier in the day and the earlier in the week possible, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Wednesday is senior day, so you might want to watch that first uh, early in the morning because we do get a good crowd out there. Monday is kids' day. We try to program for those off days, but inherently any time earlier in the day is better than later in the day, and certainly away from weekends. There's a lot of people that come out on the weekends, and if crowds aren't your thing, you might want to come out during the week. Well, this show is, uh, is taped before the fair, and so we don't know exactly when you're watching this show. So the fair is either future tense or going on right now, or you already missed it. <laughs> but uh, the State Fair runs at uh, State Fair Park from September 11th to the 21st in 11-day format, um, expecting 900,000 to a million people. Uh, high on my list is going to, I guess I'm going to have to go twice because I, I don't think I could eat the deep-fried gummy bear and the red velvet cinnamon roll on the same trip. I think I would have to... To give me a couple of days to recover. And we would and, welcome and, you out whatever day, <laughs> however many days you want to come out. And uh, lots of paved parking um, uh, and lots of unpaved parking. So uh, it, it really is a, a great and inexpensive way to spend the entire day. And the city of Oklahoma City um, has the, the, the park, that's our land, and we offer it to, to people across the state to come in and enjoy the, the, the always fun aspects of the fall in Oklahoma and everything that you can partake in at the State Fair. And Scott, please pass along our congratulations and our best wishes to the staff. I know you guys work uh, 11 and a half months, and, uh, and a lot of that work is geared toward these 11 days. So we appreciate the work on the other 363 weeks, but please pass along our thanks. I certainly will. Thank you, sir. We have one of the best state fairs in the United States. Please get out and enjoy it. We'll have more on the Mayor's Magazine right after this. Hello, I'm Sergeant Tom Piccioni. Laws about illegal parking in handicapped spaces have become a lot tougher. Your car can be towed if you're parked in a handicapped parking zone without a permit on display. Plus, the new law allows a $250 fine. Ever notice the striped lines next to some handicapped spaces? It's illegal to park there too. That space is so my friend Mark and others who use a wheelchair can get in and out. So, if you don't have a permit, don't park in a handicapped area. It's the law, and it's just the right thing to do. Welcome back to the Mayor's Magazine. In this final segment, we're going to learn more about the Mayor's Committee on Disability Concerns. And October is a month that we typically like to highlight uh, disability concerns and see how Oklahoma City can do better. Um, and on the show today, we have Jason Johnston. Jason is an interior designer, but more importantly for the purposes of this show, he's the vice chair of the Committee on Disability Concerns. And we have Pam Henry. She's the chair emeritus. Welcome both of you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Congratulations on getting into the Sports Hall of Fame. Well, aren't you nice? We have a segment where you come on as a guest and you immediately turn the focus back on me. That, you're, you're amazing, Pam. Pam and I have known each other for, for 30 years uh, back in our, our television days. And she was telling me her middle name is Sidewalks now that, that she has been working so diligently on the MAPS 3 Sidewalks uh, uh, project. So we will call you Pam Sidewalks Henry uh, <laughs> going forward. Yeah, it'll look great on the graphic at the bottom of the screen. Um, um, now I don't know where to go with this segment, but let's, let's back up a second and let Jason talk a little bit about the private sector's involvement in this committee and why he feels so personably uh, that it's important uh, for our community uh, to start looking at ways when we can in engage the community and start breaking down some barriers. Well, I think uh, years ago, uh, the mayor's committee was really about um, making, pe letting people with disabilities serve in the general community. And because of ADA and so many things that have happened and lots of work by our committee and especially George Lewis and his time, um, there are other things in the community that I was concerned about. Uh, and aging in place to me is a very important thing. Um, we have a lot of people who are in my age bracket who, as I say, may go kicking and screaming into the home. <laughs> and so um, as, as part of my practice, I try to make their homes more accessible. Um, a a roll-in shower is good whether you break your leg skiing or whether you're a five-year-old or whether you're 50 or 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I try to do, and that's how I got involved. A good a colleague of mine 
has also been doing this for a long time and her husband is a long time member. But uh, it's, it's important to me and I think we have such a huge population who are retiring who would like to stay in their homes and one of the things that I do is try to make that possible. Uh, I had a situation this last year where I was making a, a completely accessible home and for a younger couple and then he came down with uh, a disease that no longer let him walk. And so fortunately, uh, he has been in his recuperating stages. He's walking again slowly. I've been able to, to make them live in that house and it was very comfortable and was set up for someone in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Is it, a, is it a, a growing industry? Uh, people trying to have their homes redesigned on the inside to, to be more uh, I, I think friendly? so. I, I, I wish that we could get more builders uh, interested in uh, the prospect of building small accessible homes because we have so many people that would, would buy those homes immediately mm -hmm. if you they were You say the available. demand is there. The demand is there and we don't really need any more McMansions. We really need smaller homes that are, mm -hmm. that are very nice have all the bells and whistles, but are accessible. I think that's very important with, a, with a, the population aging at the numbers that the baby boomers are come on board. It's staggering, really. So the market is very definitely there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Pam, talk about the, uh, the Mayor's Committee on Disability Concerns that you chaired for so many years and now have taken a step back and kind of graduated, but still have a little bit of oversight and participation in. Well, we're always thrilled when October comes and you declare October, as you will on September 23rd, Disability Awareness Month in Oklahoma City. And October 28th will be Special Disability Awareness Day. And we have an awards program that here in September, people can go to our website, which is www.okc.gov slash council disability underline concerns and make a reservation to come to our luncheon and nominate people for one of our several awards. An outstanding handicapped person, a handicapped employer. Just, uh, we have an award for a home or a building that is accessible. And we'd love to have lots and lots of nominations for those this year. You are also serving on the MAPS 3 uh, subcommittee on uh, sidewalks and trails. So tell us about that work. The first day you appointed me to that committee and I was thrilled. The first day we held our first meeting downtown here I said my name is Pam Henry and my middle name is Sidewalks <laughs> because people with disabilities want to go to work mm -hmm. I, and number one problem with getting to work is transportation. Every bus in Oklahoma City can handle a wheelchair, every single one. That's fabulous. But if you can't get to the bus stop, or if it's dangerous to get to the bus stop, mm -hmm. then that's not helpful. Yeah, if you're competing with cars, that's, that's, that's hardly accessible. It is legal to drive in the street as long as you stay on the left side and use the crossing, the crossing paths to, to cross the street. But sidewalks are just fabulous for people with disabilities and for mothers with children in strollers and for children walking to school. And so on this subcommittee of the MAPS 3 Oversight Committee, we made up a list of important factors for where to put the sidewalks. And number one was by schools for the safety of all Oklahoma City children. Number two was the connectivity of important places and we got in there because of the fatalities that have happened on city streets with mm -hmm. people in wheelchairs, the history of accidents and fatalities in an area to be important and so those sidewalks are going strong and because sidewalks are more expensive than was originally thought, you and the city council gave MAPS an additional nine million dollars for sidewalks mm -hmm. and we are thrilled to death with that. Yeah, so, and it was available because the revenue ran ahead of expectations. The economy's been good, and we were able to, to put some additional dollars in because I th we raised the standards of what we thought a sidewalk was. You know, we have made them a little wider, and we've gone into some developed areas of the city. And when you go into a developed area, suddenly you're looking at more curb cuts, you're looking at more utility easements that you have to work around. It's a lot better, more efficient to do this on the front end when you're designing a street or laying out a neighborhood and 
unfortunately we didn't do that in a lot of cases, so we're having to go in now, but it's, it's costing us uh, more additional dollars. But probably even more important in those developed parts of the city because there's always there's already reasons to want to be there. There's, there's retail and there's, there's libraries and there's schools. Uh, all the more reason that we get these sidewalks constructed. But, I mean, we're literally building hundreds of miles of sidewalks when you add the MAPS 3 sidewalks plan with the bond issue that passed in 2007. And I'm thrilled to see those. Mm -hmm. uh, everywhere I look, there are new sidewalks, and it just makes me so happy. And there are curb cuts, and there are ways to get over a bridge without having to go on to the bridge, where it's often narrower anyway. So if there's a sidewalk path along with the bridge, then that's so much safer. And you make a good point that it's, it is all over the city because when I'm out talking in neighborhood groups or you know, to a Kiwanis club or, or some sort of organization, and I say we're, we're building sidewalks all over, I look around and, to get feedback and, and literally every head goes, yep, they, they've, they've seen it. I mean, <laughs> you can't one. be driving around very much and, and start to see the construction of the sidewalk. So it's great. And, and really, we've just started. I mean, if, if they see construction of sidewalks now, it's going to be nonstop here uh, for the foreseeable future. For, That's for right. We've years. got three phases. We started out with two. With the additional money, we have three phases. And there will be, as you say, many, many miles of sidewalks. Yeah. Pam, where would you like to see us go next? What, what effort would be next on your wish list for uh, disability concerns that Oklahoma City could address? Employment hmm? is the reason we were founded. That was started by President Truman when the soldiers came home from World War II. That was the first President's Committee on Employment of people with, with han of the handicap was the phrase used then. And that then started the Governor's Committees and then the Mayor's Committee in 1951. So employment is always number one. Mm -hmm. But to get to the employment, you need the sidewalks. You need the public transit. You need buses that come out past MacArthur because there are people living past MacArthur. And you're heading the regional transit dialogue, which is important for everyone, but especially important for people with disabilities. Well, Pam, thank you for your work. I'm, we've, we've run out of time. We are out of time. So Jason, thank you for your work as the uh, uh, vice chair of, of the committee and uh, as Pam mentioned October will be uh, Disability Concerns Awareness Month and we hope that that people will take time to learn more about it and follow up on Jason's advice to um, to consider um, building a stronger market for, for homes that are more accessible. I think that'd be in the best interest of everybody. So Jason, Pam, thank you for your work on, on that committee. Thank you, Mary. And thank you all for watching. We'll be back next month with another show. See you then.